something different in today's world that we didn't see at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For that reason, I put something a little different from what we know of the khutbah the Hajj from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Almost always you'll hear some of what I just said in Arabic in the Juma khutbah. Almost always you'll hear at least Ya yuladina amanu wa taqala haqatu qatihi wa la tamautuna illa wa antum muslimun but the imam will stop because that's the end of the ayah. But then I continued was part of the next ayah. Wa attasimu bihablillahi jami'a. Wallah to farqa. So, first I will give you the translation of this and I will tell you, inshallah, how this relates to our subject today Islam tomorrow. The future of Muslims. The ayah that you always hear has a meaning in English something like this. O you who believe, give Allah his rights by having taqwa for him, which is to put a shield between you and Allah's punishment on the day of judgment. This is what we usually translate as pious or righteous. But taqwa actually is to put up a shield between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom Qiyamah, on the day of judgment. So, it continues and it says, and don't die illa except as Muslim, as believers in Islam and followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu This is the meaning behind being a real Muslim. Why did I add that and how does that apply to my subject today, which is Islam tomorrow? Because the meaning of that next little bit is very, very heavy. And exactly what Allah tells you don't do I can promise you somebody's going to do it, otherwise he wouldn't mention it. Just as in the very beginning for the Jewish, the Christians, and certainly for the Muslims, we know that our father Adam was tested with one thing. What was he tested with? Don't kill somebody? Well, he was the first person, so there wasn't nobody to kill anyway. Don't steal anything. How can he steal from anybody? Everything was all there for him. That wasn't the problem. About fornication, the only woman created was his wife. So there's no problem there. It's one thing. He had in front of him Jannah, the lowest level of Jannah, Aden or Eden. He could eat, he could drink anything he wants from Jannah. Except one thing. Don't eat the fruit from such and such tree. When I was a Christian, I heard this pondered by some of the priests and the preachers and pastors. They talked about this subject. What did it mean? Some of them said, well, it meant don't have sex. which is really stupid because there was only two people there. <laughs> Some said that it, it indicated that they were naked, which comes up later. Some said it was just symbolic. Some even said it wasn't really a tree at all. It was just don't sin in general. They had a lot of opinions about it. Maybe some of you have thought about this question. Why? Why? Because Adam and Eve ate from a tree. How did that bring such big sin into the world? Christians are really consumed with this idea about sinning and salvation because their salvation really hangs on a pretty thin thread admitted by their own Bible that if Jesus on the cross is not real they don't have a plan of salvation. That's what it says. Paul said it. If Jesus on the cross isn't right, 
then everything we're preaching is false. Well, guess what? Let's take another look at that. Adam and Eve. In the, in the best place. They were created in the best place. Now there's Shetan is there. The devil is there. We know that. That's in their Bible. The interesting part about it is, in Islam it's clear that both Adam and Eve, both of them, they sinned, they broke a covenant here by eating from the tree. It's clear they both did it. In Islam we know that they're equally responsible, equally they made tawba, equally they were forgiven. Simple story. Very simple. And then Allah took them out of the paradise, put them on the earth, and that's pretty much how it went. In the book of Genesis, in the Bible, it clearly states that the woman is cursed even today because of Eve, what she did, and it's her fault, and blames her. And the last time I was here, we talked about the blame gun, and exactly that's how it starts, blaming other people for your mistakes. She is blamed clearly, not just by word, but extension, going on to say that not only is she cursed, her monthly cycle is a curse on her. Having pains in childbirth is a pain, a, a um, curse on her, these pains. All of this is a curse on her, and then her children are cursed because of her sins. So suddenly the sin of Adam is carried forward on generation upon generation. And then the only thing that's going to cure that up is slaughtering an animal. And the blood of that animal is going to have to pay for eating the fruit. Well, that gets pretty expensive if you stop and think about that. And this continued on for so many generations that people were making money out of this. We're talking about thousands, millenniums. We're talking many years. And when people wanted to slaughter, it had to be such and such and so and so. And by the way, the priests were the only ones that happened to have exactly what you needed, but it was going to cost you some money. Then you could be forgiven. Another thing that went along with that was if you brought the wrong kind of money, it couldn't be used in the temple. You have to change the money over here for this money. And I don't know if some of you have had this experience. I don't, you probably never had to change any money in your life, did you? Never had to trade currency, did you? <laughs> We do it all the time. And we know when you trade, you're going to lose part of your values. True? Well, there was no exception back then. According to the New Testament, it said Jesus drove these money changers out of the temple. For doing what? Made them, number one, made them buy these animals that they had. These are sacred animals. These are pure animals. Yours aren't. And you have to use this money that we have and we're not going to give you full value for it. So we'll get you twice. Once when you change the money, and then once when you buy the animal. This is what, read the Bible, this is what it says. For us. We don't have this problem. Because there was no extension here. Adam sinned. Yes. Eve sinned. Yes. Both of them made tawbah. They repented to Allah. Allah, I made the sin... I'm sorry, they cried about it, they asked Allah to forgive them, and they never did it again, so therefore, they were forgiven. Simple as that. Simple, and it's logical. It doesn't mess up your mind, it doesn't make you start thinking, okay, what kind of God is this? He's uh, mad because, and then we have to, I can't get it. Confusing. Islam is very clear. Everything in Islam is straight. You can understand it if you want to. And how does this apply to our subject today? I want you to look back one more time at this subject. Why is it that Allah said, don't eat from the tree? Was it because Allah wanted that tree for something he was going to eat later? No. Allah doesn't eat food. Allah has no needs of this creation. So why did he tell him that? Why was that order there from the beginning? Why did Allah create a tree there that he didn't want him to eat? If it's paradise, that's strange, isn't it? This is before we get into the subject of the devil tempting him and all the rest of it. As a Muslim, I think everybody here is ready to just tell me all in one voice. Because it's a test. 
We know this life is a test. Again, it's very easy to understand, isn't it? You're born, and then you die. And in between, you do stuff. What are you going to be asked about? You won't be asked about being born, because the law caused that to happen. And you're not going to be asked about how you died, unless you did it to yourself, because the law is going to cause that to happen. But what's in between is what you're going to be asked about, true or false. That's your test, isn't it? Because if there's no test, then you should just keep on living forever. But you don't. Everybody dies. Kala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kullu nafsin dayakatul mot. Every single soul will taste death. You can't get around it. I can't get around it. No matter how you try. No matter how you plan ahead with <laughs> health insurance. No matter how many people you know that are doctors that can fix stuff that breaks. You're going to die. And you're going to be seriously asked about every single thing that you did in this life. So you can party now. But the day of payment is going to show up. And then what will you do? This is why Muslims are so careful in some of the smallest details of their life because they know they're going to be asked about it. It's easy for me to say this because I've seen so many Muslims in so many countries. I will tell you, the Muslims, even today, are still the most conscientious about their belief and about their religion. Even the ones with big mistakes. I was told that in one country, an Arab country, that even when these Haramis, guys that steal stuff, before they go out to steal, they say, Tawakal to Allah, let's go. But it doesn't mean it's good. It just means this is how even subconsciously they're going to think before they do anything about Almighty God. And obviously they didn't think about it very deep or they wouldn't steal stuff. The point is though, on the tip of the tongue of the Muslim hangs the word Allah. Ask any Muslim, anywhere, anytime, how's it going? How you doing? What's up? How's the family? What will be the automatic answer? Even if he has the worst problem or just had the best experience, he's still going to start with these words. Alhamdulillah. When I was a Christian, we used to hear some people, the born-again Christians, say, praise God, praise God. We used to hear that. Sometimes. But from the Muslim, he's saying all the, all the praise, all the worship is only for Allah many times a day. Maybe even in the thousands of times, every single day, Muslims are saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I'm happy, Alhamdulillah. I'm not happy, Alhamdulillah. It's still the same answer, and this is a good sign. Now we come to, why, Yusuf, did you add the next part of that ayah in Surah Al-Imran? Why did you do that? Well, how, did, how does that work? How do I relate to that? Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about that. So don't go away. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah, wa ala alihi wa sabbi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, huwa ala'adhi jahna muslimin. In the first khutbah, I was talking about very clear proof that this life is a test. Everything about this life is a test. But Allah did not leave us. Allah did not leave us without 